Um, let me at least go back and repeat what I've said about uh, permutations because that part is important. So you take any permutation, you can write it as a product of disjoint cycles. So this example, here's a permutation in the symmetric group S11, the set of permutations of 11 numbers, one through 11. And I decompose this into a product of disjoint cycles. It happens one is a cycle of length nine and the other is a cycle of length two, which we call a transposition. And an important fact is that every permutation, in fact, can be written as a product of transpositions. And the simplest way to do that is to write your permutation as a product of cycles and then write each cycle as a product of transpositions. So if you take a three cycle, one, two, three, that's the product of two transpositions, two, three, one, three. And I want to see if I can write a four cycle as a product of, I claim I can do it as a product of three transpositions, if I'm lucky enough. Um, what might work? Um, Let me just take a look at this and see what happens. This sends, oops, not a good choice. Um, let me try this. So one goes to four, four goes to two, goes to two. So one goes to two. Two goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to three. So two ends up at three. Three goes to three, goes to three, goes to four, and four goes to one. Ah, perfect. So here, I've managed to write a cycle of length four as a product of three transpositions. And in fact, you see a pattern that is if you take the cycle <coughs> of length n, I can always write this as a product of n minus one transpositions. And I can do it in a lot of different ways. Uh, one way is on the right, I go one n, two n, three n, down to n minus one n. So for example, for a five cycle, for the five cycle, one, two, three, four, five, if I'm lucky, this should be four, five, three, five, two, five, one, five. The product of these four transpositions. So this sends one to five to two, two to five to three, three to five to four, four to five, and five to one. But this is the very nice formula for writing any cycle of length n as a product of n minus one transpositions. Now, it's, this is definitely not unique. So for example, suppose I take the cycle one, two, three. I can write this as two, three, one, three, one, two, one, two. Four transpositions. Why can I do that? Well, for one thing, this one, two, followed by one, two, that's just the identity. So, but in any case, I do have four transpositions here. So I can write this as a product of two or as a product of four. Or a product of six or a product. Of, I can do it as many ways as I want. Um, no, not as many ways. I can do it in two ways or four ways or six ways or eight ways. And there's a very nice theorem about permutations that says when you write a permutation as a product of transpositions, you can do it in many different ways, but the one thing that cannot change is the parity of the number of transpositions you use. 
and parity means even or odd. So I can write one, two, three as a product of any even number of transpositions, but I can never write it as a product of an odd number of transpositions. So that's a very uh, basic fact in algebra that has a lot of uses. Professor, can you show the previous sheets that were not uh, taped, please? Absolutely. So I started with a proof of a problem in section 1.1 that the integer z and the set of matrices of this special form are isomorphic groups, and I constructed the isomorphism. This is the isomorphism. I proved problem three in section 1.2, which was to show that the rational numbers as an additive abelian group is not cyclic. And the idea was that if you take any rational number, it's a fraction R over S, its multiples only give you fractions with denominators S. So any fraction whose denominator is not a divisor of S will not be written in this form. The simplest example would be to choose a prime that doesn't divide S, then the perfectly legitimate rational number one over P is not, in, is not a multiple of this number A. So the rationals are not a cyclic group. Problem five in section 1.2, was to prove that a congruence class in the group Z mod MZ generates the group if and only if A is relatively prime to M. And this is basically a consequence of the theorem on linear congruences that AN congruent to B mod M has a solution if and only if B is congruent to zero modulo the greatest common divisor of A and M. So that's that slide. And this was, the proof was in two parts and this was the second half of the proof. And then this was the work on permutations that I already recorded. Yeah. That's what we did. So there's one fundamental theorem in group theory that explains why permutations are important. And there's a theorem, I'll prove it in the next lecture in, in the lecture set. Every group, every group is isomorphic to a subgroup of a permutation group. And in particular, every finite group is isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group Sn. So if you could know everything there was to know about these permutations of one through n, you would know everything there was to know about finite groups. In fact, it's impossible to know everything about finite groups. They're extremely complicated, but, um, but they all can be made to look like subgroups of a permutation group. Any other questions today? Okay, well, if not, 
I will be back at um, four o'clock this afternoon. So see you then perhaps. <laughs>